Brian Phipps, I'm one of the pastors here. I want to welcome you to our time this morning. If you are here at Lenexa or if you're here at the awesome South Room, it'd be really cool if we could hear you from over there one of these days saying hi. Or up at the awesome Speedway campus or up at Lansing at one of the different campuses we have in the prison there, the Brothers in Blue. So glad to have you here. We're in week three of What If the Church which is a collaboration of up to about 60 churches in our city to not just be our individual churches, but to be the church of Kansas City together. And I don't know about you, but I think that's awesome. That deserves its own kind of go God type of moment, you know? I do think God is pleased with that. And this year, the momentum of that uh, movement is turned toward uh, investing in, walking with, and even becoming family for, as we'll see today, the foster kids that are in our city. And that's a pretty extraordinary thing. There are several ways to follow up with that. You'll hear about that this morning as we continue to walk through one detail The duffel bags that we've been collecting out in the van, which is just outside the north doors here. This is the last week for that, so make sure to be able to grab that opportunity by the 5 o'clock service tonight because that comes to an end. We started this journey of what if the church with one of the coolest churches in Kansas City. They are the Heartland Community Church down in Olathe. Dan Diebel is a great friend. Those are wonderful people. Will you give me, or will you join me in giving a warm West Side welcome to this guy? I'll take 10 more words. Maybe I'll get it right. Uh, are you doing well? Awesome. Well, I, I have come to, uh, to tell you some things this morning. Uh, when we called you and asked the question, hey, we got this crazy idea, we, we, we just kind of have this vision that the churches should play better in the sandbox, would you want to join us? You were in a very difficult transition nine years ago, and I knew you would want to, but I didn't think you'd have the bandwidth for it. And your immediate response, and this speaks right to your heart, Westside, was, we're in. And not only were you in, but you were all in. In fact, you took this little idea that that some of us had been kicking around, and you put it on your shoulders, and you brought your very best to it, and you gave your greatest leadership to it. And I just want to say, there would be no way that now, nine years later, and over 88 churches having been involved over those nine years, this would not have happened if it were not for you, your leadership, and your heart, Westside. I just want to say thank you. You have no idea the impact that you have in our city. I just want to say thank you. You're one of the biggest churches around, but you get really, really small in these ways when you pour out from from your heart. I want to say thank you of how you leverage your resources, you leverage your leadership, you leverage everything on behalf of the poor, on behalf of the disenfranchised, on behalf of the vulnerable and the lost in our city. I just want to say thank you. And in the midst of the transitions that you've had over the years, Thank you for for not looking back, for not shrinking back, but keeping your hands to the plow and pursuing the heart of God, because I just think the heart of God is really, really happy, really, really delighted in over you, Westside. Because when Jesus looks over Kansas City, I mean, I just deeply believe this, that that he sees Westside and he's like, yes, you know, and he sees Cedar Ridge and he's like, yes, and Paseo Baptist and Esperanza and and Heartland. He's like, "Ah, you know, we'll work with them. You know, I think he sees those things, you know, but he goes, that's not a church, some church or that church, that's my church. Singular, capital C, my church. And this year in this city, His church has said, what if, what if we were just to slay the dragon of the foster care system? What if we were to eradicate it such that the 3,000 children in the Kansas City area had a home? What if we were to walk with, invest in, and become a family for, I love this, like Lego house. You all know about this? There's 3,000 Legos here, all comprising to make one home representing, yeah, all 3,000 representing one child that we go, could we walk with them? Could we invest in them? Could we become a family for? Could we bring that number 3,000 down to zero? And I just think Jesus sees that, and in all of our imperfections, he just goes, that's what I'm talking about right there. 
When I said that you would be one like I and my Father are one, that's what I'm talking about. When I said that not even the gates of hell would prevail against that kind of church, that's what I'm talking about. Like one early church father said, that the church is the soul of the city. Isn't that cool? A cool phrase? The soul of the city where the city sometimes has no soul. Now that might feel a little bombastic maybe. Boastful, have there been times that the church and Christ followers have lost their soul throughout history? Yeah, that's on the historical record. But the dominant narrative within history in the last 2,000 years, whether it's been science, nursing, medicine, the arts, and many of the virtues that we hold sacred today have been shaped, if not pioneered, by people who call Jesus their king. And, and history has never been the same. Let me just give you two examples. The value of children and the virtue of mercy. Those two things really matter in our culture, right, today? Don't they? I mean, we have a hospital. It's a world-class destination hospital called what? Children's Mercy in our city. And why is it called that? Because in our culture, kids matter and mercy matters. It wasn't always that way, and we forget this. If you go back 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 plus years into the Greco-Roman era, into the time of antiquity, you find that, no, kids didn't matter the way they matter to us in kind of our Hallmarkian kind of way today. You know, they, 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 they were much more mercenary and utilitarian in their approach. Until, until, and I'll use business terms here, until you were unit producing, you didn't have much value. And then Jesus said, no, 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 let them come to me. For they bear the shadow of heaven upon their souls. And then all of a sudden, the whole paradigm went, whoop, oh my goodness. There's something inherently valuable because they're mine, God would say. Because my very image was embossed upon their hearts. They're invaluable because they are and because they're mine. And history has never been the same as a result. Mercy is the same way. We all think mercy's cool. We need more mercy. Would you all agree? We just need a lot and a lot and a lot more mercy in our culture and around us. Go back 2,000 years ago. No, 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 no. They would actually argue the opposite. One scholar would say that mercy was considered, get this, a pathological emotion. Pathological. That means you need help if you want to practice mercy. Rodney Stark, sociologist, he, he says this, in the pagan world, and especially among the philosophers, mercy was regarded as a character defect. Something was wrong with you in your character. You know why? Because mercy is unearned. In the, in the time of antiquity, you got what you deserved. You got what you deserved. So here's how this played out. A plague hits, and all of a sudden, there's there's infected, diseased, and dying people in the streets, you go, well, they must have deserved that. And even the best doctors would run for the hills. You give birth to a baby girl, and in that time and in that culture, they weren't valued as much as a boy. And you go, well, there'd be nothing wrong with just abandoning that child and even dumping that child down a sewer to her own demise, as the archaeological record would show, as Plato and Aristotle would actually even endorse. And if you're poor, we just go, well, you must deserve to be poor. There's no reason for me to help you because that's, that would be undeserving as such. Now, why would they have this worldview? Why would they be so cold and merciless? Well, because their, their view of the gods in heaven, see, they had many gods, and there was a pantheon, and they are all considered fickle, morally deficient, disinterested in what went on in human affairs and on this little, you know, pigsty called, called earth, and they showed no mercy themselves. So now imagine, imagine you're growing up 2,000 years ago. You're, you're, you're growing up in Athens. This is your rubric. This is your worldview. This is the pantheonic angst in which you, you experience life, and you have no need, no desire, no compulsion to show mercy to anyone, let alone children, but then Jesus enters the scene. And you begin to hear this story. You begin to hear this story of that Jesus is fully God and fully man, and he really, really loves all that he's created. What? You're talking about this earth that he's created? Yes, he really loves it so much so that he decided to walk among it and walk along beside us. 
that Jesus took on the flesh, fully God, fully man. And he decided to invest himself, so much so to the invested his very life on the cross. For who? For the undeserving. And by the, his resurrection on the third day, he said, now, for anyone who would want to, you're all invited around my table. You're all invited into my forever family. That's the story of what Jesus offers us. And the simple phrase, for God so loved the world, would have made a, a pagan philosopher go, what? That's crazy. Rodney Stark would continue to say this, the notion that God's care how we treat one another would have been dismissed as, and I love this phrase, patently absurd. Patently absurd. So guess who led the crazy train? Jesus. They, I mean, they just didn't know where to follow him. They didn't know where to, where to put him. And all of a sudden, you're following this, this story. You're following this person, Jesus. And there's a burning in your heart. And things are starting to change from the inside out. And you're going, oh, I get it. You mean by his spirit, I'm supposed to live as Jesus lived. I'm supposed to live out the things that he taught. Well, what did he teach? Well, some patently absurd stuff. Look at Matthew 25. We're familiar, maybe. Some of us are. But just imagine you're not for a second, okay? Just imagine you've never read this. If you've read this a lot, imagine you haven't. Okay, right? Just, okay? I'm going to block out your memory. And now just imagine, for the first time ever, you're reading the words from a man who said he was God in the flesh. And he says, and your, wor your worldview is, no one matters. No, it, like, gods don't care. But he says, no, no, no. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And the king, that's Jesus, will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Okay, so write that little me in. That's, that's there on your bulletin. I, I had thoughts of saying, could you write all the me's down? Like the seven me's of the solidarity of Jesus saying, no, 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 I really care what you do with one another. No, no, I really, I stand in the gap for not only people you like or people that you love, but people you can't stand, your enemies and strangers. I'm saying, would you do that? And when you do that, you're doing that for me. That is absurd. And his followers for the last 2,000 years have said, well, I guess we're supposed to step into that kind of absurdity, aren't we? That divine kind of absurdity. And so they went around and they saw the diseased and the infected and the dying. And at their own risk and peril, they picked up limp bodies and took them in and cared for them. They went through trash heaps, refuse piles, and found abandoned children and said, these are our kids, and they took them in to their own home. And for the poor, they said, how do we devise a system of care, not only for them, but for others, such that one emperor who couldn't stand Christians, he had to finally admit, his name was Julian, he said, not only do they take care of their own poor, but also ours as well. How embarrassing. How patently absurd. You know, what, um, you know what patently absurd means? I just made up a definition. Can I give it to you? It means you own the patent on crazy. You own the patent on crazy. That at some point in your life, you forfeit the desire to be normal or to fit in. And all of a sudden, you go, no, no, no. Normalcy will not change me. It will not change others around me. It will not change the world. But being patently absurd, like I can do that. Because Jesus the King did that. And so we have a litany of people who have lived this upside down, patently absurd life. William Wilberforce in the slave trade, Mother Teresa in the poor and the dying in Calcutta, Father Damien on the island of Molokai with lepers, St. Anthony in the care of the poor in Egypt, Rosa Parks in the front of the bus, and Wes and Cindy Ingram, my friends, my friends who are, they own the patent on crazy. I mean, they are patently absurd. I mean, just three years ago, they had this, like, really beautiful, you know, kind of life, great job, two biological children. They were just, like, cruising. And then they did this absurd thing. They decided to become foster parents. Now, how many of you are foster uh, parents, part of a foster family, you're in support of a foster family, or you're connected to in relationship with a foster family, just raise your hand for me. Let me just see. Okay. So when I say the term 
patently absurd. Does that, does that kind of connect a little bit with you? And here's, here's why I say that. Because to become a foster family, it's going to jack with your life. It's going to bring you great pain. It's going to mess with your idyllic picture of what family in Johnson County or Wyandotte should look like. It's going to start moving stuff around in the deepest places of your heart. It's going to drain your energy and, and your emotion. It's going to bring you to the end of yourself. Will it not? And it will bring you the greatest sense of joy in life, all wrapped up in one. Am I right? Okay, those of you who raise your hand, head nod or shake. I mean, you can disagree with me. That's okay. You know, I'll find you later. Okay, I'm kidding. Isn't that true? You have to be a little patently absurd to do it. Now, let me put that in a biblical context. Here's why I think that is. Here's why I think the load is so challenging. Jesus, if we go back to this call and vision of Matthew 25, he says, I want you to feed and, and pour drinks for those who don't have them. I want you to provide home and welcome to the stranger, to the alien. I want you to give provisional needs like clothing to folks, and I want you to care for the sick. And those that are stuck in any system, he said prisons, uh, but, but we'll just mean anybody who's stuck in any kind of system at all, I want you to care for them. So as, an, as a pastor, I've always thought, well, we need, uh, we need a prison ministry. We need a food pantry. We need, you know, a clothing drive. I've always seen this in like demographic segmentation where we go, we need just these different like orbed entities of care. And then we'll be living out the vision of Jesus. And we do. And we need those things. And we have those things. And you guys have them by, by, by the spades. The power, the beauty, and the great challenge of becoming a foster family is that you do all of that for one child. One child who's made in the image of God who has embossed upon their very souls the fingerprint and the breath of God in their nostrils. You do it all for one child, and no family can do it all by themselves because it's patently absurd. The challenge is absurd, and so is the joy. And so I think of Wes and Cindy Ingram. In the last three years, they couldn't not do it any longer. But they needed a community around them. They needed a lot of help coming around. They have had 13 children in the last three years. One foster daughter, her name is Renaya. And as so many of your hearts, the heart of a foster family is to say, how do we reunite uh, the daughter in our care or the son in our care back with their biological family? And so um, they did that with Renaya and they celebrated it. They because of a job, they moved to New York City. And it's there that they learned that Renaya, something went awry, and she was back into the system. And they just couldn't let it go. They would poured in so much. They'd walked with her. They'd invested in her. They'd become a family for her. And now Renaya was in their hearts, and they had to do something about it. So they, they found an attorney who, pro bono, helps foster families adopt uh, children in the foster system. And they went through all the hoops and all the uh, challenges. And just two Mondays ago, they came back to the Wyandotte Courthouse and they adopted Renaya into their forever family. And it's just an amazing story. And we, we happened to have a camera there at the courthouse. Later that night, there were about 100 friends, those that had been all in with them on their journey. Then they were celebrating and cutting cake. And I want to show you a video of all of this going down. And here's what I want you to see. I want you to see how they came to a yes place on this. I want you to see how they couldn't have done it by themselves, how they needed those around them to bring care and support. And I want you to see the impact on the life of one child that Jesus says she's worth it. Let's take a look. So every child in the state of Kansas that's in the foster care system, they have what they call a red book. And that's what, when you're sent to a foster family and that has your medical records, the police reports, everything. And whenever we need a reminder of what Renai has been through, you read the police reports. and. And all these 13 kids, we'd get these red books and you'd read these stories of bug bites, uh, 
freezing cold in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, like they're literally sleeping on deep dirt floors. When days would be hard and we would go, we would, we would get the book and we would read the book and, and remind ourselves, this is why we're doing this. Hey, hey. We're Weston Cindy Ingram. Uh, we have kids Connor, Hannah, and tomorrow we will have Renaya Ingram as our third child, which is amazing. And uh, we live in New York. We lived in, uh, we've been there for two years. We lived in Kansas City for almost five years, and we were members at Heartland Community Church. Well, Renaya came to us when she was three. Um, she came to us from another foster home. She'd been taken into foster care when she was two. I mean, we're her eighth move, sixth family that she's had at the age of five, and that's just not fair. Our goal when she came and what it looked like was gonna happen for sure was that she was gonna go back to her biological family. That's what we were trying to do. That's what we were working with her family um, and that we wanted to see happen. Um, and, you know, unfortunately it, it didn't work out that way, which led us to now being able to adopt her. And there were days that I thought, I really can't do this. I'm not, um, I'm not cut out for this. I'm not doing her any favors. I don't feel like I'm being effective in, um, in raising her and, and why would God entrust her to me right now? I'm, I'm, I'm failing at this, you know? And she left us for a while to be with her biological family. And it hurt, and I hurt a lot, and I missed her, and I was shocked, you know, because it was it was hard. And then when we found out there was a possibility that we would get her back, and we were so excited, and we were all in, you know, because um, you can't help but love her when when you see her and when you talk to her, you just you just do. She's just a sweet girl. You know, she has this infectious personality um, that. You know, right now we're on a two thumbs up system at school. So when we pick her up from school, we know if she got one thumb up, one thumb down, two thumbs down, which early on was happening frequently. And the enjoyment and the excitement she has, you can just tell there's something special that's gonna happen with her. She's very bossy. Um, her, her teachers say she's going to be a teacher because she loves telling all the other students what to do. I'll tell you what hasn't been the hardest that we thought would be um, is our, the impact on our children. I think that was going into it, our biggest concern was that we would somehow screw up Connor and Hannah's life. And we prayed through that. Connor and Hannah have learned how to really share. Connor and Hannah have learned how to really give, how to really love. Um, they've realized it's not about you. And, and they've learned a lot about sacrifice. There's one um, video we have of them ice skating where Hannah's skating backwards holding Renaya and Connor's coming up behind her just making sure she doesn't fall backwards. And it was such a great symbol of them coming around her. And having a child learn to share a toy is one thing, but to share mom and dad's time, to share your house 24 seven, is completely different. And God has just blessed them with a the spirit to be a, a brother and sister to her. Between um, our community group, our church, our family, the kids' school, God provided in so many ways. The first thing that popped in my mind was our, the very first phone call that we got after we got licensed. Um, we got our first call. They said, um, we have two bro little boys that, that need place tonight. And we happened to be having our small group at our house that night. And they were putting up baby gates. We had friends on the phone calling around trying to get us a toddler bed, trying to find a crib. We had people planning out meals. I would not have been able to make this work had these, you know, five families not been here. And they're committed and they're gonna help us with this. And it was, it was great. There's so many times I think you wait for a calling and you wait for, you a know. Sign a sign. Yeah, a something. sign from God. And for us, it was just about obedience. And we felt like there was no gotcha moment. It was, we know that the Bible and that God call us to help orphans and to help needy kids. And we wanted to do that for people that say, what can I do? <laughs> like the yeah. care portal, that's what it's there for. Yeah. Most foster kids are going literally to the foster home with their belongings in a trash bag. Yeah. I think the care portal is gonna be such a great way yeah. for people to stop and say, I'd love to give a toddler bed. I didn't know where, I didn't know you needed one. Take action, like find a foster family, become a foster parent, help a social worker, do something to get involved.
<laughs> yeah, thank you. You see this picture of one child who's worth it all. One child who is worth it all. One family coming around that child and saying, we're going we're gonna to expend it all. And a church and a community and the school system coming around and saying, but you can't do it on your own, so we're in there with you. And a whole ecosystem of care, lawyers and, and schools and the like coming together and saying, we're going to bring the soul where that little girl needs our soul. We're not all called to be foster parents, but we're capable of doing something. So what is that something for you? What is that something? We need meal makers and Costco runners. We need your company 12-passenger white van, and we need somebody to fix that va van. We need your beer fridge, if I can say that. And, and we, need, <laughs> we need your bunk beds, and we need great cookie makers, and we need those that can lobby the Senate. We need you. We need you. For anyone that calls Christ their king, this is a huge part of his heart that we get to join him in. So what is that for you? Could you imagine? Could you imagine if every single person among every single church rose up and we said, these 3,000 Legos, they're going to find a home because they represent a child with a heart with the shadow of heaven embossed upon their soul. And we're going to be all in such that not just a few of them, but all of them. And, and, and could you imagine a year or two or three years from now, the dragon gets laid and the foster care system is eradicated. Could you imagine that? No more Legos. Every children being walked with, invested in, and having a home for, that's crazy. That is absurd. Could you imagine mayors and governors coming to our city going, what's going on in Kansas City? Asking our mayor, how did this happen? You don't have any, any kids on a wait list, any kids who need placement. How did that happen? And the mayor would say, it was the church. Which one? All of them. They not only take care of their own kids, but ours as well. Could you imagine that day? And so Westside and Church of Kansas City, let's do it, huh? Let's do it. Here's what you're focusing on. Donations, you know about that, right? We need your donations, too. We need help sorting and packing those donations. Three, we need help organizing all those things going on in the warehouse at KBC. Four, we need your care portal email address. Just give us your email address and your heart and your resources will follow. And then last, here's where I want to zoom in. There's an introduction to foster parenting class coming up. Would you come to that? Would you come to that? Let me offer you a bit of where I've been on this, this conversation, this journey. I have engaged in that we're not all called to be foster parents, but we're capable of doing something. And I just moved past the called part to the capable. Since I'm not called, is what I've said, then how and where do I show that I'm capable? Where's my part in that, Lord? But then God asked me a question, an absurd one. He said, how do you know that you're not called? This is where you just start to, you know... And the honest answer had to be, because I say so. <laughs> Isn't that where most of us start on things like this? We start from the place of no, or even never, you know? That's absurd. That's not normal. There's all sorts of rational, you know, reasonable reasons why this wouldn't work in my time of life, my season of life. I mean, we all have them. That's where I start. It's like my, my daughter Hadley, when she was about five, she had three favorite words, no, never, and then ah. And she'd just go, no, never, ah. And the ah was just like punctuation to reinforce the no and the never. And I realized that's how I am in this question and in so many others. I've started with the never. And here's what I want to ask you. If, that's, if, if you want to join me in this, would you move from no, never, and would you answer the question, who does the calling? Who does the calling? You can't call yourself, folks. And would you move from never to a prayer of what if? What if I or we were to become a foster family? Would you just ask the question? Invite the caller in. Now, he might say, no, I need you here, or that's not for you. But, but could we let him answer the question? It's so much better that way. Would you move from maybe never or no 
to just simply praying the question, what if? I want to offer you, really as a prayer and as a benediction, the words of, a, of another foster parent in our community. Her name is Rachel Hillestead. And she's a beautiful writer. And she writes at a blog that I just encourage you, like, she's so whimsical and honest and potent in her words. And I asked our community within our foster care community just for, like, input on this whole conversation and got some great feedback. And Rachel offered me this blog post she just recently wrote. She says, when you're a foster parent, you know that when a child gets into that agency car to be taken away, the chances of seeing him or her again are slim to none. When you're a foster parent, you cherish the scar on your arm, which is where that two-year-old scratched you so hard you bled because she didn't want to leave. When you're a foster parent, you wonder what will happen to that little girl you told was beautiful. You'll wonder if she left you believing it. After all, she, quote, did have to leave, and you lie awake at night and wonder if she thinks that the reason she didn't get to stay was because people prefer pretty things, and she wasn't. Foster care is not for the faint of heart. How do you give them back? It's the most basic, honest, and gut-wrenching question I am often asked. The last time someone asked, I was at Walmart the day after our most recent foster daughter left. And I felt a blank space then, and I still do now. My youngest daughter does too. She constantly asks when baby T is coming back. I don't have the heart to tell her never. Maybe that's the crux of it. Baby T came to us sad and angry, a 12-month-old baby with a chip on her shoulder. But I got to see her laugh and smile. I got to watch her steps grow from faulting and unsteady to boisterous and confident. I got to see her shine. I was the first one she called mama. If you're feeling a nudge towards foster care, do it. And all I know is that the next time I'm asked that question, here's how I'm going to answer. How do you give them up? How could I do it? Well, I'd say right back, would you miss out on the opportunity to be a part of making a tiny soul whole again? Would you miss out on the opportunity to help her regain a tenuous hold on a troubled existence that was fragile from the moment she was born? Would you miss out on the opportunity to show her that her footsteps matter? Would you miss out on the opportunity to be the first one to hear her first great big belly laugh? Never. Never. I've never missed that opportunity. And would you, and would I, would you move? If you're there with me in this place, would you move from never to, oh God, what if? Man, we love kids. We love the 3,000 in foster care around our city, and we love the kids here. You'll see it if you're around here tomorrow. <laughs> kids gig starts tomorrow. You can still register your kid out in the Connection Center, but let me paint a picture for you on this. We'll do kids gig again next year, and wouldn't it be cool to see a lot more of those kids sprinkled in, the 3,000 sprinkled in in our kids gig next year? that could happen. We also have an opportunity next Sunday for baptisms. It's going to happen out in the pond. It's not too late to inquire about that and to participate in that. All you need to do, if you want to participate in that, is grab one of those Connect cards and just put your contact information, your name, drop it in one of the boxes on the way out. We'll contact you. We'll tell you what that's all about. We're going to be doing baptisms again, again, and again. Wouldn't it be cool? to have more and more of the foster kids in our city experiencing that with us as well. If you need to talk to someone, we'll have prayer partners down front. They'll be able to talk to you about next steps, pray with you, whatever you need. We love our kids. We love you. God bless you, Westside. See you next weekend. <laughs>